Hello, welcome to online lecture of Physics 103. So far, we talked about different physical quantities that uh, describe the motion of an object, such as velocity, displacement, acceleration, force and work, energy. We also talked about power. We further need some more quantities to describe the motion of an object, okay? So in this uh, uh, lecture, I'm going to talk about mainly two quantities. The new quantity that I'm going to discuss in this uh, uh, lecture are impulse and momentum, okay? So in this slide, I'm going to talk about a situation where the force on an object is not constant. So, so far we talked about the situation where force was constant. Force was constant. Okay. If you want to discuss some situation where force is not constant, rather variable. In this case, we have a baseball coming towards left with velocity V0 and the baseball is hit by a bat. The force exerted by the bat onto the baseball is F, okay? And because of the force, the, the baseball goes to the right with velocity Bf, okay? So what happens in this case is the, the baseball bat exerts a large amount of force for a small interval of time. So the force is very large, okay, huge, okay? Force is huge in the small interval of time, okay? The small, small interval of time, okay? In this case, as you know, the force is not constant. If you wanna study the overall effect of a force acting over time, then we need to define a new quantity, which is called impulse, okay? In the next slide, I'll be talking about force versus time graph in a more systematic way. So this is a nicer version of the previous graph. So as you can see here, you have a force in the y-axis here. This is your y-axis and the, for, uh, the time is on the x-axis, right? This is the time, this is x-axis. From zero to 20 seconds, the force goes on increasing okay, from zero to 30 Newton. Then from 20 to 15, uh, 20 to 50 second, the force remains constant, which is 30. And from 50 to 70, maybe this is 70, then force goes on decreasing from 30 to zero again, okay? So everything happens within 70 second. So in this case, the force is variable to figure out overall effect of a force over time, we need to find the average force, okay? So let's find the average force in this case. So how do you find the average force? So it should be something like here, right? So average force should be somewhere here, but how do you find it? To find the average force, first of all, you have to find the area under the curve, okay? This is the curve. So what is the area under the curve? area under the curve, then divide by time, that gives you the average force, okay? That's the definition of average, okay? Average force is defined as area under the curve divided by time for which the force act, okay? To find the area under the curve, let's figure out, uh, let's, Let's uh, divide this uh, area into three parts, okay? This is part one, this is part two, and this is part three. So the part one, the orange color, so what is the area of part one? Part one is the triangle, right? In the case of triangle, what is the area? One over two base times height, okay? So what is the base from here to here is 20 second. Okay. Then what is the height? Height from here to here is 30 Newton. Okay. So this gives me two times 10, 20, 300 Newton. Okay. 
So now let's figure out the area of the part two, which is blue. Okay, the area of part two is so length time, length times width, right? So length is 20 to 50. Length is 50 minus 20 second. Then what is the height? Height is this is 30. Okay, times 30 Newton. So this gives me this is 30 second times 30 Newton, which is 900 Newton second. So part three is also a triangle and the area of the triangle is one over two base times height. What is the base of the triangle? Triangle has the base 20 second, right? And what is the height? Height of the triangle, 30 Newton. So if you do that, then you get 10, which is 300 Newton second. So add them all together. What is the area under the curve? One plus two plus three, that gives you 300 plus 900, 300, 900 and 300. So the total is 1500 Newton second, right? That's the total area. So area under the curve is 1500 Newton second, 1500. So what is the total time? Total time is 70, right? So, so 70, so this is Newton second and this is second, second and second cancel out. You end up getting 21.42 Newton, okay? That's the average force, meaning the average force is, average force is somewhere here, 21, like this, okay? In this slide, I'm going to talk about the definition of impulse. How do you define an impulse formally? Okay, so the, the impulse is defined mathematically. If you multiply the average force with the time, then, then the product is called the impulse of a force. Okay, or, or simply impulse, right? And uh, this time is a scalar quantity and the force is vector quantity. So if you multiply vector with scalar, you definitely get vector. Okay, then what is the direction then? The direction of the impulse is same as the direction of average force. And what is the unit of the uh, impulse? As you know, the force has the unit of Newton and the time has the unit of second. So if you multiply Newton and second, you get Newton second. So in this slide, I'm going to talk about interesting fact about average force. So in this curve, you see the variation of force over time. Now, so if this height represents the average force and this interval is the time for which the force is being applied, then you can define a rectangle here. Okay, this is the rectangle. If you find the area of the rectangle, Remember, the area of the rectangle in this case is defined by the average force. So if you find the area of this rectangle, then that rectangle has the area equal to the area under the curve, this curve, this area, okay? So the, in other words, the area under the curve, which is red, this area, area under the curve, is equal to area of the rectangle defined by defined by the average force okay so after defining uh, impulse, uh, let's define the linear momentum, okay? So from everyday life, we know that it is difficult to stop an object that is moving faster or having faster or that are heavier, okay? 
So faster meaning you have higher velocity, heavier meaning you have a bigger mass, okay? So now to, so to understand this kind of tendency of an object, we need to define another quantity called linear momentum, okay? So how do you define the linear momentum? The linear momentum of an object is the product of the object's mass times velocity, okay? Uh, object's mass times velocity. So in other words, the P, which is linear momentum, we represent by little p here, okay? Remember big P is for power and little p is for linear momentum, okay? So little p, which is linear momentum is equal to the product of mass and velocity. Again, the linear momentum is a vector quantity because it is the product of the scalar and vector. And uh, what is the direction of uh, linear momentum then? The direction of linear momentum is same as the direction of velocity, okay? And what is the unit, by the way? What is the unit of linear momentum? Linear momentum has the unit, since mass has kg and velocity has meter per second, so the unit of linear momentum is kilogram meter per second. So in this slide, I'm going to talk about impulse momentum theorem. So I'll start with average acceleration, which is change in velocity over time for the change, right? We know from Newton's second law, law, you have average force is equal to mass times average acceleration, right? Now, if you plug in the value of average acceleration from here to here, then what do you get? M times Vf minus V0 over delta T, okay? If you multiply both sides by delta T, then what do you get? This delta T, delta T cancel out, then you end up getting delta T times average net force equals MVF minus MV0, okay? So MV is the momentum, right? Linear momentum. So if it is MVF, that should be final linear momentum. You have V0, that's why this is initial linear momentum. So what is final my initial? Final my initial is change, right? That's the change. So what is this on the left-hand side? This is impulse. So what does it say is impulse equals change in linear momentum. Okay, this is called the impulse momentum theorem. So it means the impulse is changing linear momentum when delta T is small, like in this case, okay? In this kind of situation, when delta T is small, then impulse is equal to change in linear momentum. Okay, let's do an example here. So in this example, we are going to use impulse momentum theorem. So the example, a rainy storm, right? A, uh, rain comes down with a velocity of negative 15 meter per second negative meaning the rain is coming down, downward is negative, upward is positive. Okay, that's the direction. And hits the roof of a car, the mass of rain per second that strikes the roof of the car is 0 0.060 kg per second. Assuming that the rain comes to rest, meaning the final velocity is Vf equals zero. This is by the way, this is initial velocity, V0 equals negative 15 meter per second. Assuming that rain comes to rest upon striking the car, find the average force exerted by the rain on the roof, right? All right. So in this case, we can use the um, impulse momentum theorem. So according to impulse momentum theorem, average net force times the delta T is equal to change in momentum, right? This is the impulse momentum theorem. Let's use this formula here. Um, we need to find the average force. So how do you find the average force? Divide both sides by T gives you, 
this delta t delta t cancel out then you have average force is equal to what um what is bf bf is zero m times zero minus m times b zero m times zero minus m times b zero which is negative 15 here by delta t right so this gives you negative negative plus 15 m over delta t okay so once you figure out m over delta t then you can find the average force right so what is m over delta t so mass of rain per second that strikes the roof of the car is this. So if you see the unit here, it's very clear that this is kg over second, right? Kg is mass, unit of mass, and second is unit of time. So this is what exactly this guy is. So then 15 times, you have 0 0.06, 0 0.06. If you multiply this together, you happen to get 0 you happen to get 0 0.9 Newton. Okay, that's the average force. So, okay, in this slide, I'm going to talk about the principle of conservation of linear moment. Okay, this is very important principle. And uh, the principle says, if the sum of external forces is zero, then final momentum is equal to initial momentum, okay? It means there is no net external force, meaning summation F, is zero, okay? Under this condition, linear momentum of a system is conserved, meaning the initial momentum of the system is equal to the final momentum of the system, okay? So this is called conservation of linear momentum, okay? In other words, the total linear momentum of an isolated system is constant or conserved, right? What is an isolated system, by the way? Isolated system is that in which the sum of average external forces acting on the system is zero, meaning this, okay? So if, if you want to use conservation of linear momentum, then you have to make sure the system is isolated. So principle of conservation of linear momentum is useful in analyzing collision, okay? So what is a collision? When two or more objects come close together or hit and exert forces on each other for a short time, that is called collision. Analyzing collision. For instance, if these two guys collide, okay, they come in contact for a very short time. Okay. And in this case, those internal forces cancel each other. And since the contact happens for a short time and internal forces cancel out, linear momentum is always conserved. Okay. So same thing happens for uh, explosion also. Meaning principle of conservation of linear momentum holds not only for collision, but also for explosion. All right, so in this slide, we are going to talk about uh, different kinds of collision, okay? So mainly there are two kinds of collision. One is elastic collision, the other one is inelastic collision, okay? As you know from previous slide that for any kind of collision, the conservation of linear momentum holds, right? It means in both type of collision, elastic and inelastic collision, principle of conservation of linear momentum holds. In the case of elastic collision, not only the principle of conservation of linear momentum holds, but also the conservation of total kinetic energy hold. Meaning in the case of elastic collision, the total kinetic energy of the system before and after collision are equal to each other, okay? 
However, in the case of inelastic collision, the total kinetic energy of the system after the collision is not equal to the total kinetic energy before the collision, okay? So mainly what happens is during the collision, some energy is lost. That's why kinetic energy after the collision is less than the kinetic energy before the collision. So in the case of inelastic collision, if the object stick together after a collision, the collision is said to be completely inelastic, okay? For instance, if you throw a body on wall, okay, body on wall, what happens is the body sticks to the wall, right? And that kind of collision is called completely inelastic, okay? So on the right-hand side, you can see the examples of collision, right? So in the case A, what happens is the object is coming, falling from this height. And if the, if the collision is elastic, then the object goes back to the same height, okay? Because there is no kinetic energy lost during this collision, okay? That kind of collision is called elastic collision. By the way, elastic collision is kind of a ideal case ideal situation rather. In everyday life, the collisions are almost always inelastic, okay? Okay, similarly in the case of B here, what happens is if you drop an object from this height and this collision, which is the collision between this ball with the surface, then the ball does not go to the same height as, as before, okay? So that's why this kind of collision is called inelastic collision. And what is completely inelastic? So the collision is completely inelastic if the ball stick together to the surface. In this slide, I'm going to show you a cartoon which clarifies the difference between different kinds of collision, okay? So let's see, this one here, the red ball, so this is the red ball collides with the surface, but it reaches the same height as before after collision, okay? That's why this is elastic collision. On the other hand, this bluish ball, okay? Every time it, every time it collides with the surface, the height goes on decreasing and finally comes to rest. How about the other kind of collision? Let's say this is the kind of collision which is completely inelastic or maximally inelastic collision. Now we'll be talking about a collision in one dimension. So we have an example here, which is a, a ballistic pendulum. You can see a wooden block and uh, we fire a bullet. And as a result of that, then the pendulum starts oscillating, okay? Let me show you the video here. Three, two, one, five. Okay, so the mass of the block of wood is 2.5 kilogram and the mass of the bullet is 0 0.01 kilogram. The block swings to a maximum height of 0 0.65 meter above the initial position. Find the initial speed of the bullet. So this is A. B, is the collision elastic or inelastic and why? And D, you have to find the energy lost. As you know, in the case of collision, the linear momentum is conserved, right? Let V01 is the velocity of the bullet before collision. V02 is the velocity of the block before collision. Vf1 is the velocity of the bullet after collision, Vf2 is the velocity of the block after collision. By the way, this Vf1 and Vf2, they are same in our case because bullet is embedded into the block. So let's say this velocity is Vf simply, okay? In this case, the velocity of the block before collision is zero. That's why this guy is zero. So in that case, you can rewrite this guy as M1 plus M2 you can factor out Vf. 
right, equals M1, V01. So if you divide both sides by M1, you end up getting V01 equals, equals M1 plus M2 over M1 times BF, okay? So to figure out the initial velocity of the bullet, you have to figure out the you know, final velocity, Vf, right? You might wonder how come this system is isolated, right? If the net external force is not zero, then you cannot use the principle of conservation of linear momentum. But how come this system is under the influence of gravity and you consider it to be isolated, right? say gravity, right, is acting down and you might have to figure out what are the forces acting on this object in the upward direction and see whether the system is in equilibrium or not, or whether the ex total external force is zero or not. So that is the problem in the vertical direction, but in the horizontal direction, there are none of the forces acting on it. That's why you can safely apply conservation of linear momentum in the what uh, in the horizontal direction okay all right so let's figure out bf then to find bf we have to use the principle of conservation of energy right so let's say this is point 1 this is point 2 point 1 is at a height of d from the ground okay and point two is at a height of D plus HF. HF from the ground. Then what is the potential energy of this guy? M1 plus M2 GD. What is the potential energy of this guy here? M1 plus M2 Z D plus HF. This guy can be written as M1 plus M2 GD plus M1 plus M2 GHF. Okay, so it means in the case of initial, in the case of point one, you have this potential energy. In the case of point two, you have this potential energy plus this potential energy. Okay. You have, you have this term added to this potential energy here too, okay? So what you are going to do here is you are going to use the conservation of energy, right? So in this case, so potential energy one plus kinetic energy one equal to potential energy two plus kinetic energy two, right? Since you have this common term in both side here and here. So it is customary that we choose this D to be zero because in the case of potential energy, it is the difference that matters. So that's why this D can be chosen to be zero. Okay, all right. So it means this is the surface, right? This is the surface now. So D is zero. Okay. So in this case, what is the potential energy? Potential energy is M1 plus M2 G times zero, right? What is the, this is potential energy one. What is the kinetic energy one? it has the velocity of BF one over two MB squared, which is M1 plus M2 BF squared. Similarly, what is the potential energy here? Similarly, potential energy here is MGH, right? Where M is M1 plus M2, G is G, what is your H? H is HF. That's my PE2, okay? So what is uh, Ke2? Ke2 is, at this point, the system is at rest because this is the maximum point. It cannot go further. 
that's why we call it maximum right so it cannot go it cannot go further meaning the velocity is zero that's why when the velocity is zero one over two mv squared then kinetic energy is zero so then what is the conservation of energy here pe1 plus ke1 equals pe2 plus ke2 okay pe1 is zero ke1 is one over two m1 plus m2 bf squared equals pe2 m1 plus m2 ghf plus ke2 is zero okay so divide both side by m1 plus m2 What is your BF? BF is square over two equals GHF. BF is BF equals two GHF because if you multiply by two on both sides, this two and two cancel out. Then uh, BF is square here. Then BF equals the square root of two GHF. Now you simply plug in the value of all those quantities. If you do that, then you happen to get, let's see, you have square root of two, G is 9.8, of course, and HF is 0 0.65, right? 0 0.65, right? This is your BF, right? All right, so now from the previous slide, we had B01 equals this, right? Now we have the value of BF, okay? What is the BF? Let's plug this in. B01 equals M1 plus M2, over M1 BF, okay? Now, M1 is mass of the bullet, right? 0 0.01. What is the mass of the block? 2.5 kilogram. What is the mass of the bullet? It's the same thing again, 0 0.01. Then what is your BF? The square root of two times 9.8 times 0. 6, 5. If you do that, you end up getting 896 meter per second. Look at that. The bullet is very fast, 896 meter per second. In one second, the bullet moves 896 meter. Okay. Next question you have to answer is, is the collision elastic or inelastic? As I said earlier, uh, in everyday life, almost all the collisions are inelastic, right? So, so what is the definition of uh, elastic collision? In the case of elastic collision, not only conservation of linear momentum valid, but also conservation of total energy valid, right? But in the case of inelastic collision, the conservation of kinetic energy is not valid. It means the initial kinetic energy changes to different forms of energy. Okay, that's why initial kinetic energy is not equal to final kinetic energy. Okay, so what kind of different, what do I mean by different um, energy? Let's say heat energy, sound energy, and it's something like that. Do you think when the bullet collides with block, is there, do you, do you think heat is produced there? Yes. Okay, do you think you hear the sound? Yes, it means your kinetic energy converted to heat energy and sound energy. That's why this, um, this collision is inelastic, okay? So one rule of thumb is that if you hear a sound in any collision, it's very easy that uh, the collision is inelastic, okay? So, but in this case, I'm going to show you or prove that the 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 collision is inelastic okay how do i do that by by the help of uh, kinetic energy okay let's do that so before the collision the what is the kinetic energy the block does not have kinetic energy right that's why the kinetic energy of the bullet is the kinetic energy of the system that's why this is the kinetic energy before collision what is the kinetic energy after collision kinetic energy after collision is kinetic energy of the bullet plus kinetic energy of the bull, um, kinetic energy of the 
block, right? So add them together, that's why you get the M1 plus M2 BFE square. Okay, because they have common velocity, right? Because the bullet is into the block, okay? Now let's see whether these two quantities are equal, okay? So what is your M1? M1 is 0 0.01. What is the velocity of the bullet? We found that the velocity of bullet is 896 squared. Then what is here? One over two, what is M1? M1 is 0 0.01. What is your M2? M2 is 2.5. What is your BFE squared? Your BFE squared is your BFE squared here, right? So your BFE squared is two times 9.8 times 0 0.65, okay? If you do the calculation here, then you find that these two guys are not equal, okay? It means the collision is inelastic, right? So in fact, the right hand side here, if you do the calculation, you get, I'll give you the number here, 4014.08 Joule. If you plug this guy here and do the calculation here, this gives you uh, 16 Joule, okay? Then what is the energy difference? Energy difference is Ke2 minus Ke1, which is 4014 minus 16, which happens to be 3998 Joule, okay? So this much energy is lost during the collision, right? All right, so let's do one more problem here. The archer, an archer stands at rest on frictionless ice and fires a 0 0.5 kilogram arrow horizontally at 50 meter per second. The mass of the archer is this, 60 kg. With what velocity does the archer move across the ice after firing the arrow? So what, I'm, what it meant is when he fires the arrow, the archer will move backward, okay? So let's see. So in this case, we can use the conservation of linear momentum because the, the archer fires the arrow horizontally. That's the good news, okay? So even though there are forces involved in the vertical direction, let's say gravity and normal force by the eyes on the person, and we have to see whether those forces are balanced or not, okay? So that's the thing we need to worry about in the vertical direction, okay? If the net force is zero, then the system is isolated and then we can use the principle of conservation of linear momentum, right? But in our case, we're talking about horizontal direction and there are no forces involved in the horizontal direction. Even though there are forces in the vertical direction, but we are not concerned about those forces, okay? We don't have to see whether those forces, forces are balanced out, okay? We just have to worry about our horizontal direction. In the horizontal direction, we can safely use principle of conservation of linear momentum, okay? It means we can use PI equals PF, all right? So what is your PI? So M1, B1I plus M2, B2I, okay? In this case, M1 is mass of the archer and M2 is mass of the arrow, okay? This is arrow and this is archer, all right? So, mass of the archer and his initial velocity plus mass of the arrow plus times its initial velocity is equal to mass of the archer times its final velocity. So plus mass of the arrow plus its final velocity, right? That's your final momentum. So initial momentum is equal to final momentum, okay? 
So in the beginning, both the archer and arrow, they are at rest, right? That's why these two quantities are zero. Okay, left-hand side is zero. So zero equals M1, V1, F, plus M2, V2, F, right? Uh, we are supposed to find the velocity of the archer, right? So we are supposed to find this guy here, this one. So how do you find V1, F? If you subtract M2, V2, F from both sides, minus m2 b2 f then you got this cancel out then divide both sides by m1 this cancel out then you got b1 f equals minus m2 over m1 b2 f okay this is the formula you need to use to find the velocity of the archer let's plug in the value minus m2 is 0.5 mass of the arrow, what is M1? Mass of the archer, which is 60 kilogram, right? And V2F, so what is your V2F? So, and fires, yeah, this is your V2F, which is uh, 50 meter per second. So that's why if you do that, you will get negative 0 0.417 meter per second. So this remember, this negative sign indicates that when he fires the arrow, he will move backward according to Newton's Thal law, right? So that's what the negative sign telling us. All right, let's do one more problem here. An SUV versus a compact, okay? So there is a collision. An SUV with mass M1, so an, an SUV with mass this, okay, let's say M1 equals, 1.8 10 to the 3 kilogram is traveling eastbound at 15 meter per second east is positive west is negative okay east is positive so which is b1 i initially right is moving east which is 15 meter per second and what is your m2 while a compact car with mass this so that's the m2 M2 is 9, 10 to the 2 kilogram. And what is your uh, B2? It's traveling westbound, right? Which is negative. B2I is equal to negative 15 meter per second, right? We can use principle of conservation of linear momentum, which is M1, E1I, which is M1, E1I, plus M2, V2I equals you have M1 plus M2 VF. Okay, that's the uh, linear momentum after collision. Okay. So this is the momentum of SUV before collision. This is the momentum of compact before collision. Okay, so before collision is on the left hand side, left hand side, then since they entangle after the collision, we add them together, we add the mass together. And uh, since they entangle after collision, we have common velocity Bf. So then the total momentum after collision is M1 plus M2 Bf, okay? Then if you wanna find the Bf, what do you do? Just small divide both sides by M1 plus M2, right? M1 plus M2, right? So then BF equals, you just plug in the numbers there, okay? BF equals, what is my, what is my M1? M1 is 1.8, 10 to the three, B1I is 15, okay? Plus M2 is 9, 10 to the two, what is my B2I? B2I is negative 15. So this negative makes this plus minus here, right? Then divide by M1 plus M2, right? M1 plus M2 is 1.8, 10 to the three plus nine, 10 to the two. Okay, if you do this calculation, I'll just give you the number here, okay? Then you get BF equals, five meter per second, right? 
So far, we talked about inelastic collision. Now in this slide, I'm going to talk about an elastic collision. We have two objects, one and two. I label them one and two. One is having mass M1 0.5 kilogram. The two is having mass M2 equals 3.5 kilogram. The first one, M1, is moving with velocity V1 equals four meter per second. This is plus, maybe it is going to the east. And in that case, our waste will be negative, okay? Then the object having mass two, mass M2 has velocity V2 equals zero, okay? Which is at rest, right? Then what is the initial momentum of the system here? Initial momentum of the system is M1 V1 plus M2 V2, right? Since V2 is zero, you don't have to write V2 here. That's why this is the initial moment of the system. Then what is the final moment of the system? So since we don't know the final velocity of each of them, right? But we know the mass because mass is conserved. Mass does not change. So M1 is the mass of the first object. V1 prime is the velocity of the first object. M2 is the mass of the second object. V2 prime is the velocity of the second object, okay? How about the total kinetic energy? The, the, the kinetic energy of the object one is one over two M1 V1 squared. And kinetic energy of the object two is M2 Vt squared. One over two M2 Vt squared, but V2 is zero. That's why this is zero. You don't have to write it. So this is the total uh, kinetic energy before collision. Then what is the total kinetic energy after collision? So you have to add the kinetic energy of the object one and object two, right? Since the object one after collision has velocity V1 prime and object two has the velocity of V2 prime after the collision. So what is the kinetic energy of the total system, entire system? One over two M1 V1 prime square for the first object and one over two M2 V2 prime square is the kinetic energy of the second object, right? So these, these should be equal, right? In the case of elastic collision, not only the conservation of linear momentum is valid, but also the conservation of total kinetic energy valid, right? That's why we have two equations here. This is for the momentum, this is for the kinetic energy, right? Let's begin with this equation here. If you subtract minus M1 V1 prime from both side, from both side, what do you get? You got M1 V1 minus M1 V1 prime on the left-hand side. And this guy cancel out, you got M2 V2 prime on the right hand side, right? Now, if you divide both sides by M2, what do you get? M2, M2 cancel out, you got V2 prime equals M1. You can factor out M1 here, M1, V1 minus V1 prime over M2, right? Now, let's plug in this V2 prime here, this V2 prime here. And what do you get? We have one over two M1 V1 square minus, let's bring this guy to the left-hand side, minus one over two M1 V1 prime square equals, then what do you have here? One over two M2, what is V2 prime? V2 prime is this guy here. So M1 over M2, V1 minus V1 prime, okay, this whole is square, right? That's what it is. So multiply both sides by two M2. Okay, so if you multiply both sides by two M2, then what do you get? This two and this cancel out, this two and this cancel out, this two and this cancel out. Then you are left with M1, M2, V1 square minus M1, M2, V1 prime square equals M2 square, M1 over M2 square, V1 minus V1 prime square, right? This guy and this guy cancel out. All right, so if you uh, factor out M1, M2 here, 
you got b square b1 square minus b1 prime square equals m1 square b1 minus b1 prime square okay so now we have to use two formula here one formula is a square minus b square equals a plus b a minus b as you have done this in high school similarly a minus b square equals a minus b a minus b right okay this, this is a minus b twice and here a minus b and a plus b okay so here let's do that m1 plus m2 then what do you get here this is a square minus b square right b1 minus b1 prime b1 plus b1 prime equals m1 squared this is a minus b squared right so b1 minus b1 prime b1 minus b1 prime all right b1 is the velocity of the object one before collision and b1 prime is the velocity of the object one after collision so they are not obviously same right if collision happens there will be change in velocity so that's why this guy cannot be zero meaning they cannot be same okay so b1 cannot be equal to b1 prime it means this cannot be same meaning if b1 equals 3 and b1 prime equals 3 it means they did not collide because initial velocity is 3 final velocity is 3 meaning there is no change in velocity meaning there is no collision right so this situation cannot happen because this is collision right so, so since b1 minus b1 prime cannot be equal to 3 minus 3 meaning cannot be equal to 0 okay so if this is not 0 then you can want you can divide both sides by b1 minus b1 prime so this is cancel out this is cancel out So remember, x divided by x is not always one, okay? Because if x is zero, then what happens is zero over zero, not equal to one, because zero over zero is undefined. That's why I want to make sure that b1 minus b1 prime is not zero, okay? So with that, let's plug in the value of m1 and m2. m1 is 0 0.5 m2 is 3.5 what is b1 b1 is 4 what is b1 prime we don't know then what is your m1 m1 is 0 0.5 squared what is one b1 b1 is 4 minus b1 prime right so if you do that you got 1.75 4 plus b1 prime okay equals 0 0.25 4 minus b1 prime okay so let's do it here let's do it here so what we have here this multiplied together gives you 7 plus 1.75 b1 prime here you got 1 right because 1 minus 0 0.25 b1 prime okay if you add 0 0.25 b1 prime on both side this cancel out then what do you get you got seven plus two b1 prime equals one subtract minus one subtract one from both sides you got six plus two b1 prime equals zero this implies b1 prime equals minus six over two which is minus three okay 
or you can simply plug in V2 prime. You can find V2 prime from here. Let's plug this in here, okay? So this M1 is 0 0.5. This V1 is, V1 is four. V1 prime is minus three, right? Minus minus plus. Okay, what is your M2? M2 is 3.5. All right, seven, two, if you do that, you have to get one meter per second. All right, so calculate the velocity of two objects following an elastic collision. So we got one meter per second and negative three meter per second, all right? So before I conclude this chapter, I'm going to talk about center of mass, okay? Uh, this is very interesting concept. So you might have done this in the childhood. Suppose you have a broom and if you find a point which balances the broom like this, then that point is called center of mass, okay? Here are a few examples. Suppose you have two stars, okay? They are of equal mass, right? Exactly same mass. Then where is the point of, uh, where is the center of mass of those two stars? Right at the center because these, these stars are exactly of same mass, okay? Similarly, if, uh, if one mass, one star is heavier than the other star like here, then what happens is center of mass goes to the heavier side. So in example three here, the sun is much more massive than planet, right? In this case, what happens to the center of mass? So center of mass goes very closer, closer to the sun, okay? So that's the concept of center of mass. And why is this important? So I can explain that by using this slide here. So why is center of mass very important concept? Okay, we are not going to go in detail, but in this level, I'm just going to introduce simple concept of center of mass and how center of mass is very important, okay? Let's take a look at this example here, okay? In which, a firework in which a firework rocket explodes in flight, okay? So now if you are talking about the motion of this firework, right? What is the Newton's second law? Newton's second law is summation F equals MA, right? So A is acceleration of the particle, okay? There are numbers of particle here, okay? Which particle do you take? Do you take the center of, do you take the acceleration of the, all the particles? No, okay? What you do is you just take the acceleration of the center of mass, okay? So this is the beauty of our center of mass, okay? If you have a system of particle, then if you want to write Newton's second law of motion, okay? Then it is F equals MA, obviously. But there are many, many particles, then if you want to take the acceleration of the system, which particle do you refer to? Okay, there are many particles. Okay, you, you don't have to refer any of them. Okay, in fact, you find the center of mass and find the acceleration of the center of mass. Okay, that's called ACOM. Then multiply by the total mass of the entire system because there are numbers of particles what is the mass of all the particles all together? That's the big M, okay? So that's the mass times acceleration, okay? Which is equal to net force, okay? So meaning for the system of particle, Newton's second law is written in this way, where center of mass is used on the right-hand side, okay, in the MA part. With this, I wanna conclude this lecture, thank you.